For 10 years, Nikita Khrushchev wielded more power than anyone in Soviet history except Stalin. He tried to put a human face on Soviet tyranny, and for a brief moment, it seemed as if he might draw the lines of freedom more firmly for his fellow countrymen. It was in his day that Alexander Solzhenitsyn got his break, but he used his power clumsily, leaving behind an erratic record, rockets in Cuba, Berlin ultimatums, persecution of the church, a battle against abstract art. In the end, he was cast aside to spend the last seven years of his life in a restless retirement. Khrushchev's personality came across with the aid of no interpreter, but his smiles were deceptive, his promises untrustworthy, his embraces too strong, too dangerous. his life, Khrushchev showed himself to be tough, energetic, quick-witted, ambitious, and gifted with a talent for plain speech. He got on well with peasants and workers, and he was ready to share the hardships and dangers of frontline soldiers. He was a true product of peasant Russia, born in poverty on the borders of the Ukraine. He joined the Communist Party in 1918 when he was 24 and he steadily worked his way up the party hierarchy, improving his education as he went along. In this, he was fortunate in the people he met, the most important being Stalin's wife. Khrushchev was party chief of the Ukraine in the war, having somehow survived Stalin's purges. He served with distinction at the Battle of Stalingrad, and he was with the troops when the Red Army re-entered Kiev. After the war, Stalin brought him into the Politburo, where he became one of his intimates, though Khrushchev lived in constant fear that Stalin would turn against him as he had done against so many others. Nobody ever heard Nikita Khrushchev say a bad word about Stalin, not in the days when Khrushchev was on his way up in the party. Khrushchev was one of Stalin's boys, and he did Stalin's bidding. He was sort of a people's politician, carrying out whatever missions Stalin gave to him. He was not one of those who were well known. I was in the Ukraine in World War II when Khrushchev was there. We didn't hear about Khrushchev in those days, but he was busy. He was climbing the ladder. He was getting ahead. And one reason he got ahead, as he said in later years, was because he was a buffoon. He made jokes. He made Stalin laugh. And Stalin sometimes asked him to dance the Gopak, a Ukrainian dance. As Khrushchev said later on, when Stalin asked you to dance, you danced. Early in March 1953, Stalin breathed his last. There would be no more dancing to suit a tyrant's whim. Instead, a grim jockeying among his cronies for the power he bequeathed them. In this deadly game, the winner turned out to be the pudgy, bald-headed man from the Ukraine, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev. Each of Stalin's heirs had blood on his hands, but the man they feared most was Beria. In the center here, Stalin's police chief. What happened next is not exactly known, but within three months of Stalin's death, Beria had been arrested by the Red Army and executed. The power of his police apparatus was broken, and soon Khrushchev emerged as party secretary. 
with his associate, the hard-drinking Bouganen, as premier. Khrushchev quickly eased conditions inside Russia, denouncing all Stalin's crimes in a devastating speech to the 20th Party Congress in 1956. Khrushchev knew that for Russia to go forward, she had to have the opening to the West. She could no longer live in this closed atmosphere without Stultifying. And he felt, too, that if he brought a lessening of the terror, if he brought a genuine thaw into the country, that he would be the benefactor of it. It would not only free creative impulses inside the country, but he, Khrushchev, would take the credit for it and would take the credit for the great gains which he thought his country would be able to make. Among the many evils of Stalinism, according to Khrushchev, was his abuse of fellow communists like Tito of Yugoslavia. To repair the damage, Khrushchev embarked on a course of personal diplomacy. There was repair work to be done in China, too, though later Mao Zedong and Khrushchev parted company in a bitter quarrel over communist policy. One of Khrushchev's main objectives was to break the ice of the Cold War, to make a dent in the solid front which had been built up against Russia by the long Stalin years. He went beyond the borders of the world of communism. He went to England, he went to France, he went to India. Wherever there was a possibility, he wanted to extend the word that this was a new Soviet Union and that he, Khrushchev, was not a Stalin. In India, Khrushchev was always ready to place a wreath at Gandhi's shrine, though he hardly subscribed to Gandhi's ideals. In Eastern Europe, Khrushchev's desalinization policy had violent repercussions. The Hungarian uprising of 1956 threatened to wreck the entire Soviet empire. On Khrushchev's orders, it was brutally suppressed by the Red Army. But the United States was also anxious to ease the tensions of the Cold War. Vice President Nixon broke some of the ice in a visit to Moscow in the summer of 59, which produced a widely televised clowning match. You must not be afraid of ideas. This is translated and Mr. K replies forcefully, we are telling you not to be afraid of ideas. We have no reason to fear them. Well, then let's have more exchange of them. We all agree on that, right? Six years after Stalin's death, Khrushchev came at last to the United States for a whirlwind tour of the great bastion of capitalism. It was a trip full of drama, excitement, humor. Some of the most ludicrous things that had ever happened happened to Khrushchev. The impact on the United States was great. Because they saw this man for what he really was. He was a human being. He was one of the most human beings that I ever saw in my life. He was human in the cornfields of Robert Garst out in Iowa. He was crazy about corn, and Garst was the greatest corn man in the United States. And he couldn't get enough of it. He loved the hogs. He went back to Russia and tried to grow corn all over his country. It was a disaster. But in Iowa, it was wonderful. He couldn't get over Iowa. If he could have transplanted himself, he would have become an Iowa. So it made an effect on the United States because of the humanity of this man and the genuineness of his gestures, whether they were wild and threatening or humorous and ludicrous or even sad as they were sometimes. And at the same time, it made an impact on Khrushchev. He was never the same again. In Hollywood, in answering a speech by Spiro Skouris, in which the film magnate boasted of his own humble origins in Greece, Khrushchev showed his readiness to bandy words. Words which were never spoken entirely in jest. We work as humble bus boys. Because of the American system of equal opportunity. Now I'm fortunate to be president of 20th Century Fox. Это производит очень сильное впечатление и на меня, и я выражаю вам большое уважение свое. Но меня этим вы не поразите. Если вы хотите знать, кто я такой, я стал трудиться, как только научился ходить. What you said about working since you were 12 
certainly produces a very great impression. Uh, impression. It impressed me too. But you can't surprise me by that, because if you want to know who I am, I started working as soon as I learned how to walk. Я премьер министра великого советского государства. And I am the prime minister of the great Soviet state. Вы сейчас идете впереди нас. For the moment, you are ahead of us. Нам еще надо хорошенько поработать и попотеть, чтобы вас догнать. We still have a lot of work to do to catch up with you. Принаряжем. We'll do that. We'll do our best. Догоним. We'll catch up. Обгоним. We'll surpass you. И вперед пойдем. And we'll go forward. Это мое убеждение. That's my conviction. Вы можете смеяться над этим, но посмеетесь, когда мы, знаете, обгоним вас и скажем, господа, капиталисты, до свидания, наш поезд сюда идет. Пожалуйста, за нами. You may perhaps laugh now, but when we overtake you, wave our hand and, hands and say, uh, 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 capitalists, goodbye. Our train is going ahead. Catch up if you can. <laughs> He saw the United States and he didn't quite know how it ticked, but he knew it did tick and it ticked so much better than anything in the Soviet Union did. But the impact remained with him. He went back to Russia determined to exceed, as he said, the production of the United States. We will bury you, he said in a great moment of bravado. He knew that they couldn't. He knew it was impossible. <laughs> From the bottom of my heart, I want to express uh, my gratitude for your kind hospitality, for your uh, bread and salt, as they say in our country. I hope that in uh, the relationships between our two countries, we will be able to use uh, more and more often uh, the good short American word, okay, uh, until we meet again, friends. <laughs> Khrushchev's success seemed complete. A visit to Moscow by Britain's Harold Macmillan had paved the way for what everyone hoped would be a triumphant summit meeting in Paris, scheduled for May 1960. There are compelling reasons why we should not fail. Today, mankind cannot afford misunderstanding, suspicion, hostility. Errors of judgment based on ignorance or anger, could lead with dreadful speed to the extinction of civilization. Mankind knows that the effects of nuclear war would be not only horrible, but universal. Mankind expects the participants in this summit meeting to work honestly and intelligently for measures toward genuine peace. But the summit was doomed. Shortly before, the Soviets had shot down an American U-2 reconnaissance plane over Russia. The U-2 flights, of course, had been going on over the Soviet Union for some years. The Russians knew that they were going on. There was no way in which they could interfere with them. They were so high that their missiles couldn't reach them. But when Eisenhower accepted responsibility and said he had known of this flight, he left no way of retreat for Khrushchev. Khrushchev came to Paris with his internal power in the Soviet Politburo gravely threatened. Despite his smiles on arrival, he was in an ugly mood. At a tense press conference, he appeared with a Red Army Marshal to deliver a furious castigation of American policy, as though the thaw in the Cold War had never taken place. <laughs> In 1960, in the worsened atmosphere, Khrushchev returned to America hoping to subvert the United Nations to Soviet ambitions. He came to the United Nations to denounce the United States, to reach down and take off his shoe and bang it on the table in the United Nations Assembly, a gesture such as the United Nations had never seen. It was not a very pleasant visit for Khrushchev. It was a bad post-mortem to the triumph of 1959. gladly allow any form of inspection and control that is accepted by the Soviet Union. A large number... I... 
But I'd like it translated if you were saying anything. <laughs> All the time we need to remember that the hopes of millions of people are fixed upon us in this assembly. And for their sake, we must not fail. It was the rough side of Khrushchev's character which the world now saw. At Vienna, Austria, he tried to intimidate Eisenhower's successor, the youthful John Kennedy, a change in attitude which reflected internal politics in the Kremlin and Khrushchev's own weakened position. First came the Berlin Wall, put up at the instigation of the East Germans. Then a propaganda offensive on behalf of Khrushchev's protege, Fidel Castro. Дядя Сэм распыхался сигарой, к миру воспылав любовью ярой, шить не лыком, руки вроде чисты, грабил Кубу лапами батисты. Неплоха была статья дохода, но взошла над Кубою свобода. Куба, да, у Кубы всюду братья, кто расторгнет их рукопожатие. Дяди жаждут злобного разгула, атомная снится и макула. Рад бы дядя вновь отведать Кубы. Эй, полегче, обломаешь зубы. In Khrushchev's Cuban adventure, the stakes ran high. The Russian people were unaware how close they were to nuclear war. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. I call upon him further to abandon this course of world domination and to join in an historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. Kennedy's tough stand forced Khrushchev to withdraw his missiles from Cuba, though he tried to bluster it out. While in the West, and probably within intimate circles in Russia, it was quite clear that Khrushchev had suffered a grievous defeat in the missile crisis. He presented it to the Russian people as a success. He explained that the missiles were only put into Cuba in order to protect Cuba from American attack, and that in withdrawing them, he had obtained a pledge from President Kennedy not to attack Cuba. Ordinary Russians were not to know that Khrushchev's gamble over the balance of terror had gone fatefully wrong. Most of them had no access to free news media. But at least the missile crisis gave the two superpowers a new respect for each other, which led to the signing of the nuclear test ban treaty in Moscow in 1963. In his years in power, Khrushchev made the most of a series of Soviet successes in space. They distracted attention from the political regime which he represented. For Khrushchev's power rested on a party dictatorship which left out in the cold artists, intellectuals, religious believers, and national minorities, including Jews, and which worked by selective intimidation. For all his political antics and circus shows, Khrushchev could never introduce freedom as it is known in the West, because if he did, the Soviet regime would itself disappear. He loved all of the fall de roll, all of the conventions of what the Westerners would call normal political campaign life. And as he went around Russia, he in fact was campaigning for himself. He was trying often to build backfires against opposition within the Politburo. And this was one of the things that led to his, his fall. The Politburo would take a line and have a vote on a particular policy. Then Khrushchev would suddenly appear in Stavropol or in the Kuban someplace and make a speech surrounded by crowds of, uh, of uh, peasants calling for the opposite line and then they would send party resolutions to the center, and sometimes Khrushchev could change the course of events in that manner. He knew he was a politician, and this is an important thing to remember about Khrushchev. I don't think Stalin thought of himself as a politician. Stalin thought of himself as a figure above politics. But I remember talking with Khrushchev once about this subject, 
about politics, I think I'd said to him that he would have been a good politician in the American sense, and he would have. He said, oh, Mr. Salisbury, you don't know. He said, uh, politics is the hardest thing in the world. He said, you have no idea how hard it is, how dangerous it is. He said, I know, I've been through it. And he spoke with such passion and force that I immediately had a vision of this man who had survived by his wits in the Stalin era and who had continued to survive in the post-Stalin era by his wits. And eventually those wits were to prove not quite strong enough to carry him all the way through. In 1964, Khrushchev celebrated his 70th birthday. He seemed irrepressible, but his associates, many of whom he had brought forward himself, had decided he had to go. They waited until he was out of Moscow and then moved to oust him. Against the united front of his erstwhile comrades, Khrushchev was powerless. Khrushchev was a man of transition. A man of transition from the iron regime of Stalin, the regime in which his character had been formed and the regime which was to dominate Russia during the whole part of the century, between that regime and something new. But he was a flawed man. He was an ebullient character. He even tried to rouse the people and become a popular people's politician. But the system was too strong for him. The bureaucrats would not have it. The police bureau would not have it. They were frightened by him. His gestures were too strong. He waved his arms too much. He waved his missiles too much. They didn't know where he was going. He crossed the lines. And this was the fatal mistake which Khrushchev made. Too many people became alienated from him. And in the end, they simply dumped him. It was testimony to the fact that you cannot make a transition so swiftly from an iron regime like that of Stalin's to something more contemporary.